Hello, I'm Cullum Coleman, and welcome to Historical Humans Reads, where we take primary sources and bring them to your screen. Today, we are reading The Way of the Samurai, written by Inazo Natobi, a 19th and 20th century Renaissance man of Japan and son of a samurai. This work provides a Japanese perspective on Bushido at a time during which Japan was undergoing massive social change. Originally published in English, The Way of the Samurai explores the ethos of Inazo Natobi's Japan and contextualizes it in a way more easily understood by the foreigners of his day. We'll be reading Chapter 3, Rectitude or Justice. Here we discern the most cognate precept in the Code of the Samurai. Nothing is more loathsome to him than underhanded dealings and crooked undertakings. The conception of rectitude may be erroneous, it may be narrow. A well-known known Bushi defines it as the power of resolution. Rectitude is the power of deciding upon a certain course of conduct in accordance with reason, without wavering, to die when it is right to die, to strike when it is right to strike. Another speaks of it in the following terms. Rectitude is the bone that gives firmness and stature, as without bones the head cannot rest on top of the spine, nor hands move, nor feet stand. So without rectitude, neither talent nor learning can make of a human frame a samurai. With the lack of accomplishments as it is nothing. Mencius calls benevolence man's mind, and rectitude or righteousness his path. How lamentable, he exclaims, is it to neglect the path and not pursue it, to lose the mind and not know to seek it again. Where men's fowls and dogs are lost, they know to seek, to seek for them again, but they lose their mind and they do not know to seek for it. Have we not here, as in a glass darkly, a parable propounded 300 years later in another clime and by a greater teacher who called himself the way of righteousness through whom the lost could be found. But I stray from my point. Righteousness, according to Mencius, is a straight and narrow path which a man ought to take to regain the lost paradise. Even in the latter days of feudalism, when the long continuance of peace brought leisure into the life of the warrior class, and with it dissipations of all kinds and gentle accomplishments, the epithet Gishi, a man of rectitude, was considered too superior to any name that signified mastery of learning or art. The 47 faithfuls of whom so much is made in our popular education are known in common parlance as the 47 Gishi. In times when cunning artifice was liable to pass from military tact and downright falsehood for Rus de Guerre, this manly virtue, frank and honest, was a jewel that shone the brightest and was most highly praised. Rectitude is a twin brother to valor, another martial virtue. But before proceeding to speak of valor, let me linger a little while on what I may term a derivation from rectitude, which, at first deriving slightly from its original, became more and more removed from it, until its meaning was perverted in the popular acceptance. I speak of geri, literally the right reason, but which came in time to mean a vague sense of duty which public opinion expected an incumbent to fulfill. In its original and unalloyed sense, it meant duty, pure and simple. Hence, we speak of the Gary we owe to parents, to superiors, to inferiors, to society at large, and so forth. In these instances, Gary is duty. For what else is duty than what right reason demands and commands us to do? Should not right reason be our categorical imperative? Geri primarily meant no more than duty, and I dare say its etymology was derived from the fact that in our conduct, say to our parents, 
though love should be the only motive, lacking that there must be some other in authority to enforce filial piety. And they formulated this authority in Giri. Very rightly did they formulate this authority, Giri, since if love does not rush to the deeds of virtue, recourse must be had to man's intellect and his reason must be quickened to convince him of the necessity of acting aright. The same is true of any other moral obligation. The instant duty becomes onerous, right reason steps in to prevent our shirking it. Geary, thus understood, is a severe taskmaster with a birch rod in his hand to make sluggards perform in their part. It is a secondary power in ethics. As a motive, it is infinitely inferior to the Christian doctrine of love, which should be the law. I deem it a product of the conditions of an artificial society, of a society in which accident of birth and unmerited favor instituted class distinctions, in which the family was the social unit, in which seniority of age was of more account than superiority of talents, in which natural affections had often to succumb before arbitrary man-made customs. Because of this very artificiality, Geary in time degenerated into a vague sense of propriety called up to explain this and sanction that. As for example, why a mother must, if the need be, sacrifice all of her children in order to save the firstborn, or why a daughter must sell her chastity to get funds to pay for the father's dissipation and the like. Starting as right reason, Geary has, in my opinion, often stooped to casuistry, and it has even degenerated into the cowardly fear of censure. I might say of Geary what Scott wrote of patriotism, that as it is the fairest, so often the most suspicious mask of our feelings. Carried beyond or below right reason, Gary became a monstrous misnomer. It harbored under the wings of every sort of sophistry and hypocrisy. It might easily have been turned into a nest of cowardice if Bushido had not a keen and correct sense of courage, the spirit of daring and bearing. This has been The Way of the Samurai by Nazo Netobi. If you enjoyed this video and would like to hear more excerpts from original texts, please follow or subscribe to us on your platform of choice. If there's a work you would like to hear, be sure to like the video and leave a comment below. Thank you for listening.